after this very inspirational uh, opening remarks by S.G. Ban, uh, I move over to our really special guest uh, for the day, uh, uh, Mr. Fawad. And uh, uh, he uh, is this Mr. Fawad Al Sunaiti. He's the CEO of Education Above All. And he's another person who is making this event really possible. So I'll ask Mr. Fawad to say a few words and uh, just a, a few things about him uh, that I think are really important. Mr. Fawad is a real visionary in education and he really wants to take education forward, especially education for sustainable development. And he joined EAA in December 2012 as the Director of Administration and Finance, where he successfully set up the foundation uh, of management systems and was involved in developing his first strategy plan for the, five, for the next five years. Fahad is active in the foundation's resource mobilization plan and leads the establishment of EA's international entity in the United Kingdom. And in uh, 2015, Fahad was promoted to be the deputy CEO and then the CEO in January 2016, reflecting the valuable role he plays at EA. So really, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, over to you, Fahad, for your uh, introductory speech. Thank you so much. And we are really very excited for this uh, important lecture today. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you to Columbia University for hosting us today. We are honored to be here in the home of the oldest universities in the world and largest endowment of any academic institutions. Free thinkers, prestigious alumni, and the presence of a guest and leaders with us today. We are here today to share lessons from the field. Let us first set the context of the target goals for 4.7 to achieve the sustainable development goals. Regardless of where a child is born, education is a fundamental right for human rights. Yet, 244 million children worldwide are still out of school children, unfortunately. Education Above All Foundation has over 12 years experience in supporting children and two schools. Since 2012, we have been working with our partners to reach over 15 million out-of-school children in more than 60 countries with the support from Qatar Fund and other partners. To achieve education for all, we need to use many different intervention and entry points. We have to rethink and expand of our understanding of foundational learning. At Education Above All, our mission is to develop the whole child to support the prevention of holistic education. We need children who are healthy, safe, well-adjusted, and can think creatively. We need teachers and a school that can center to these needs. We also need to address the key challenges in the world currently, which is the economic crisis. We need the innovative financing solutions to solve them. I'm looking forward to hearing the lessons we have to share today from many experts in this room. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fahad. I'm grateful that you are here today with us sharing your vision and making this event really possible. If we can get the slide on, we have just a small Mentimeter uh, to start thinking about foundational literacy, because here we are thinking of redefining it. Let's get our initial uh, reflections on um, the Mentimeter in terms of what foundational literacy uh, really means to us. So what is foundational literacy? If we can use that uh, link to tell us what foundational literacy is. And just for us to reflect, meanwhile, the folks who are sitting here to see 
what does it really mean to us? And I think this is the moment of redefining it, uh, really reflecting on this word transformative and how do we want to link uh, basic foundational uh, literacy here as we go forward. Are we going to get the results up maybe or maybe later? So around 300 people have joined online. I just want to give them a chance also because otherwise it will be a private meeting and it's great that uh, everyone is here, but I think uh, it's nice to be inclusive and let others also join who are in various places. Foundational literacy, quality education, access, science education. I think it's um, this word quality can also be again subdivided into various different topics, access, uh, emotion, social, emotional, vocational, numeracy, learning about life. It's amazing. Amazing to see these answers. Thank you for all our participants who are there sharing with us uh, all these amazing ideas as we go forward. Um, so now maybe we'll move on to uh, Hugh McLean. Uh, he's joined online and maybe we can have the spotlight on him. Just a few words on uh, on Hugh, and he is really the person who is the lecture part of this uh, event today. He is delivering the lecture on foundational literacy, and we hope that his lecture helps us to uh, rethink what foundational literacy here means. Um, so just a few words about him. Hugh is based in Almaty in Kazakhstan, where he reads, writes about education, aesthetics, activism, and film. Um, who also has worked in education uh, in his professional life as an uh, activist, teacher, funder of education. He was active in South African student movement and trained a lot of teachers. He started a teaching center in a remote rural um, uh, uh, resettlement village. He also has non-formal education experience, adult literacy experience, trade unions, rural farm worker groups. He's worked with rural farm worker groups. Uh, he's worked on community development skills uh, for incarcerated youth. So I think he's really the best person who's covered a lot of ground experiences. And today we'll get a sense of his uh, scholarly work. I just have to mention, it's not written here, but he's a very strict editor. And he made me work very hard for a thousand words piece. So he's that is also a part of his bio because I really worked hard only on a thousand words essay. So, but he's really very critical and very reflective and I'm uh, grateful that he was he's able to join today. Uh, can we have you? Hello, Radhika. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think he's joining from uh, South Africa and was worried about his internet connection. Mm. Hopefully it will all work out. Hi, Radhika. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Hugh. Ah, hello. Thank you very much for letting me know. I'm yes. not sure if anyone in the session can yes. hear me yet. We can hear you, Hugh. Oh, you can. Great. Oh, that's excellent. Over to you. <laughs> well, hello. And uh, thank you very much. Actually, I'm speaking to you from um, from Johannesburg, South Africa. So right from Almaty, I've kind of gone back to my roots for uh, the next uh, two weeks. But it's a great uh, privilege to be here with you all. Um, and thank you very much to the previous two speakers, um, Fahad al Salaiti and, of course, Ban Ki-moon, for setting the scene uh, so well. And thank you to all of you for your introductory thoughts on foundational learning. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I think it's a fundamental uh, discussion, um, not only for policymakers, but primarily, of course, for educators and uh, learners themselves. I do have um, an online um well, a presentation, Radhika, I'm not quite sure how you want to do it. And I'm quite happy for you to drive it from that side. I can just say, next slide, next slide. Yeah. Only if my slide can move. Yes. If your slide can. Oh, there we go. Okay. So that's fine. So I'll just save slide to slide. And I, I have roughly 15 uh, minutes. I will try to stick to timeline. Please do let me know when I've got five minutes to go or something, Radhika. 
So, look, the foundational learning debate is um, in some ways as old as education itself, but in, in some ways also a very new discussion, I think, because the word, the term itself has just become popular recently. If you've been in education as long as I have, you might remember we spoke about basic education, which they still do in many parts of the world. And the idea of what is foundational learning is a relatively new idea. So it's come to us, I think, at this point, in the midpoint in a way to the 2030 uh, goals, with a very particular set of debates around it, a very particular policy package behind it as well. And of course, enormous um, momentum coming at the idea of, of foundational learning, primarily from the Gates Foundation, but also the World Bank's uh, learning poverty crisis. And this, I think, has given the term and the idea considerable impetus in the field. But in addition to that, of course, there are as many notions of foundational learning as there are teachers. And there are many are many teachers and notions of foundational learning as there are contexts and, and pupils. So as you've done for yourself, you see something that is defined very much by users and, and by practitioners. But this particular debate, I think, in the field has um, a, a very specific genesis and largely uh, grew out of a debate uh, two years ago in the Center for Global Development's uh, Symposium, a pathway to progress on SDG4, and a relatively provocative um, paper written by the wonderful and late uh, Giran Bihari, who was the head of the Gates Foundation's work for, for education globally. But Giran's intervention really was a key one, I think, which galvanized a lot of discussion in the field. And that what he said, he said essentially, what are we doing, people? Kids need to learn to read and write by a certain age, and we're not doing that. What is wrong with our systems? And his um, solution was that absolutely, um, absolute priority should be given to foundational numeracy and literacy. And this, of course, sparked a huge debate, not only because it, it um, has consequences for funding and policy, but also but for teachers in the classroom are thinking, well, what am I actually doing? I'm teaching reading, but I'm also teaching other things. That's part of my remit, but actually there's so much more to it. So what is it? So it's led to quite a debate in the field, I think. And it's very important for us to look at this debate, particularly in, in the context of the ideas that you're looking at and thinking about today. What is resilience? What do we need to learn uh, about in terms of climate, uh, climate change and the particular set of challenges that the world faces today? So that is just by way of the introduction to the debate. I'll try to tuck into some of the ideas. My entry point for this debate, I should just say, was uh, from the point of view of the awful editor uh, that Radhika pointed out. I have to say she's not as hard to edit as she might think she is. But um, I, at NORAG, which, as you know, is a network of um, practitioners, academics, 40-year-old uh, network, actually been around a long while of practitioners, mostly in the global south. So the view that I present today is largely from a collective um, of essays in their special issue, special issue nine coming up, it'll be out in about November. And we looked at the idea of what are the debates in foundational learning and just as and possibly more importantly, what um, are the ways in which this works through in practice? The people that are actually doing this work on the ground, what are they thinking? How do they understand it? How do they define it? And the uh, contributions to this are largely from the global south. There are a few key ones from the global north, looking at prison education, um, forest schools in, in, in Switzerland, but um, a lot of the contributions are in fact from the global south are, are, and are shaped within those debates of uh, colonialism and decolonialization as well. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, Radhika, I'd be grateful. Thank you. So, yes, I think the thing that you probably all know is, is that the debate, as you've seen it in the field, does tend to polarize rather unhelpfully around almost the caricatured positions, if you like. On the one hand, there's supposed to be a position, those people who believe uh, foundational um, learning is only about foundational numeracy and literacy, and those people that feel it, it's around about so much more. And I think in reality, we find our talking, our discussions and our ideas and our practice somewhere in the middle. But the poles of these debates are really important because, as I say, they have such significance from a policy and funding uh, point of view. And that determines what is done in a classroom setting when there's so limited time as to what you spend your, your time with. So our feeling is the divide has been unproductive. And I think the essays in the, in the NORAG selection really start to, to unpick what this means. 
The other point I just wanted to make uh, today uh, is briefly about the idea of crisis. Um, those that have been involved with the education field know that uh, we talk about things always in terms of crisis. There's a learning crisis, there was a, an attendance crisis, there's a girls' education crisis, there was a skills crisis. There's so many crises. And the point that Janet Reutemann, I think, very helpfully makes around the idea of a crisis is that firstly, crisis sets up a discussion in a particular way. It's always a political and uh, choice as to what we determine a crisis whether we determine climate change a crisis or not, is a very significant uh, mental and policy and action step to, to take. So what we designate a crisis is very important, but I think her, what she puts her finger on is really crucial as well. And that she says that as soon as we say something is a crisis, we limit our options in a particular way, our ways of thinking about it. And we tend to see things in terms of their deficits in terms of rather instead of what they what they could be. So let's move on quite uh, quickly uh, now. Those are the debates, and I think you'll have access to these slides and some of the links if you do want to look at it. That's just a word, the famous um, South Up map from uh, from NORAG to, um, to say that the campaign is about the South also knows and to contextualize the debates in the context of knowledge uh, from the, the Global South, pushing back against the policy hegemony that is often set by, uh, by donors in the Global North. Next slide, please, uh, Radhika. So you started asking what foundational learning is. If you listen to the World Bank, it's about learning poverty, and there's even an equation there. Um, a lot of practitioners and policymakers feel it's just about numeracy and literacy, as I said. And there's a big movement, I think, in the field saying that well, even the OECD um, focuses on social and emotional skills, SES, and they do, are doing a global comparative international study. They're putting out one, they're busy with the analysis at the moment, it'll be coming out quite soon. They're saying these things also matter. Any educator knows, I think, that it's a combination of the both and tend to see um, foundational learning from the point of view of whole child development or holistic education. And I think what you're thinking about today is, of course, the idea of resilience, um, which is an important idea for all of us, but raises a question for me, because sometimes the onus for change is placed on the individual and how you adapt to sometimes a less than desirable external situation. And sometimes I think if we're thinking about transformation, we have to think about that those external situations as well, and not just how we respond to them individually as people. So the question I think for the NORAG special issue is if these are the debates, what does practice tell us? And if you could move on to the next slide, it does start, I think, to tell us a few um, interesting and different things. Um, firstly, it shows us that um, despite what the, it seems like in the debate, it's just not feasible for a school, for any education institution to teach only literacy and numeracy. I mean, quite apart from the fact that kids have to eat and, and walk around from class to class and play in the background. And you, you can't just teach learning and not teach uh, about um, geography, emotional development, um, religious studies, uh, history, uh, social studies, sustainable development. All of these things can happen. And of course you can teach literacy in the context of all of those things. So somehow the debate itself, I think just foundational numeracy and literacy caricatures uh, the discussion. A bit and with team approaches in schools and proper management of course this can be approached on a far broader front so the teachers as the song goes are doing it for themselves and they have found ways i think to deal with the children as soon as you deal with children that are in front of you in a particular way you think about their emotional needs you think about where they are um, in terms of their learning and what they need to to know and i think in this context the idea of foundational learning becomes something that is very, very linked to the very notion of pedagogy. It's the idea of where is a class or a child at the moment? What do they know? How do you establish that? And how do you move from there to what comes uh, next? This is a, a, a fundamental question for any teacher. It should be a fundamental question, of course, is any, in any curriculum or learning institution. But unless that is taken seriously, anything we write about um, foundational learning in, uh, in, in policy or purely in, in um, um, academic research uh, papers are not at the point of action, which is where um, teachers find themselves in the classroom every day. So if you can move on to the next slide. From the, um, from the contributions to the NORAG special issue, of which Radica is one, it seems to me that there are three ways, at least, we need to think about foundational learning. And the first one, I've just called them foundational learning one, two, and three. 
the first way we need to understand and think about foundational learning is um, foundational learning one, this intrinsic, but an essentially unstructured. I think that is the most important um, thing about it. But it's an intuitive way in which all learning occurs from early childhood, in fact, right through life. How do we learn things as a citizen? These are the things that you learn almost without noticing. And they're really important. Um, a lot of teachers and educators talk about the hidden curriculum. Of course, that is something that is intrinsic. It's the messages you pick up, pick up that you aren't necessarily taught consciously, but sometimes they can be just as important as the things that are taught in a, in a structured way. So just to bear that in mind, a lot of the um, articles, in fact, all of them in the, the special issues deal with intrinsic learning in some way. And teachers understand this, that students, learners are learning things intrinsically in classes, um, whether they are part of the formal lesson or not. The second uh, uh, way of thinking about foundational learning, and I've called it foundational learning too, is the extrinsic or essentially a structured place. And this is what, is what is the curriculum all about. These ways of thinking might in fact be non-intuitive, but sometimes they are established by pedagogy through methods and ideas where the understanding is that if you teach things within a certain sequence, um, you need to learn to add and subtract before you can get to equations, for instance. You need to do your equations before you get to calculus. So teachers understand that there's certain things that need to be structured and built in. And all of our learning, in fact, formal learning, is built around foundational learning, too, in a very, very deliberate way. But I think what the articles in, in the special issue point out for me was really interesting was actually this third approach and understanding of foundational learning. And this is how does at any stage of learning, what is foundational becomes the starting point for another stage of learning. So it's not as if there's only one uh, thing. Uh, foundational learning is not only what you do at the bottom on the first row, um, learning to read or write. In fact, a number of the articles um, point out that even before you get to reading, there are a range of predispositions that are foundational. You can't learn to read, in fact, if you facing various traumas in the home, or if you're an adult who knows how to read, um, but possibly your life has led you down a different path and you've ended up struggling uh, or in prison, uh, your re-entry point into learning is a total question that's about a deep predisposition about how you get interested in reading again. So the most foundational thing that you have to deal with often, um, particularly with kids that are on the margins or kids that are migrating, kids whose lives and, 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 and communities have been destroyed by conflict or, or climate change. There is a whole range of things to con consider. Um, so those predispositions then become important, but at every stage of learning, I think the teacher and the learner face the question of what is it that we know? How do we know what we know what we know? And how do we move on to the next stage? What becomes foundational for, for the next stage? So foundational learning in this context, I think, becomes something that is fundamental to pedagogy, something that all pedagogues need to understand and build on. And it's a combination, an interplay, if you like, between what is understood intrinsically, what you learn extrinsically, and how these things combine together in intuitive um, and uh, instinctive, but also structured ways in the way that you engage with knowledge moving forward. Um, any advanced craftsman or advanced person, whether it's anything from judo to, to chess, has a combination of conscious, deliberate skills where they know exactly what they're doing, but also instincts about this is the moment just to make this move. And those things are, are deeply embedded in our, in our understanding of skill and in our consciousness. And learning, in fact, is a part of the interplay between those, those instinctive and um, or conscious and, and, and not so conscious moves and um, ideas and instincts. So we need in our understanding of education and teaching uh, to understand that I think these three types of approaches to foundational learning are always at play. And I think the articles in the um, the special edition and certainly um, yours as well, Radhika, show us just how much, how important the context is for shaping um, one's inner life, one's consciousness, one that one's understanding of why learning is important. Um, how does one respond to climate change? It's as much an emotional um, and political commitment as it is an intellectual and um, a question of purely cognitive uh, understanding. If you could move on to the last slide as well. This, um, that's it. Also, of course, then, 
raises questions about um, what education outcomes are. And I think all of us that have been involved in the field know that education outcomes is something that drives policy, that drives political discussion. Um, and the, I think looking closely at what foundational learning is calls us to think very differently about what learning outcomes actually are. And I've tried to sketch or draw out here um, what the, uh, the article suggests may be some of the differences. And the first one is, of course, that learning outcomes are generative. They're not, it's not just a static result of what you learn um, in, in an exam and what you can show on paper, but they're about how we engage what we don't know, how you feel instinctively you need to, to approach areas of knowledge that you don't know. And this is something that is, is just as important as being able to repeat something that you do know. Um, and this, of course, is linked to the second, that learning outcomes then are internalized and durable competencies. They're not things that might be learned and forgotten without consequence. So if you've done geography at school, how many of you still remember what an oxbow um, lake is or a, or a spur? But that's not necessarily important. What is important, I think, is to understand that... Uh, Geography, topog geographical topographies change. They change in response to certain stimuli. Uh, they change over time. And this has consequences for, for planning, how we think about agriculture, how we think about, uh, how we think about um, planning cities, roads. Uh, those are the things that matter. So it's a question of this application of, of knowledge. Thirdly, learning outcomes are as much about collaborative and shared knowledge as they are about individual competencies. Um, and I think the ideas of and notions of competition that are so built into particularly Western education systems. Education not is not necessarily something you need in order to prove yourself better than anyone else. But a lot of the skills that are most valuable uh, and in your working life um, are those that involve collaboration, working with others, sharing and doing this in emotion, emotionally intelligent ways that care and understand and listen to other people rather than just to try to show off expertise and knowledge in a particular way. Um, learning outcomes are also um, continuous and interlinked. A lot of our examination of, 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 of subjects and, and children is about knowledge and discrete packages. Do you know your equations? Do you remember all certain dates in your, in your history? But it's those transferable skills, um, the ability to understand uh, knowledge, how to use knowledge, how to think about the things you don't know, how to how to come to terms with the fact that we know so little um, when in fact we have uh, studied so much and what to do about it, how to approach it. Those kinds of competencies, I think, are absolutely uh, crucial. And I'm really thankful that a lot of those sketches are kind of developed by uh, some of the authors, Radiker's piece uh, as well. Um, and lastly, learning outcomes are as much about effect, feeling, in other words, aesthetics and dispositions and ethics as they are about technical proficiencies. We forget this uh, in education and education policy at our peril. The world is going to really rely on um, these notions, affect how we feel about things, where our commitments actually lie, what the dispositions are for working together, for working together to change the planet, to working together to find ways to stop war and bring about peace. Those are the things that matter, and those are the things that are built in our education systems, and those are the things we need to be thinking about as well as part of the foundational learning package, if you like. So the idea of foundational learning, as I said, I think for most educators gets beyond the narrow, very narrow and sometimes caricatured idea of foundational numeracy and literacy without diminishing how important those two fundamental skills are but understanding that they're embedded in, in, in so much more. And just to close, I'd like to, to um, echo Janet Reutemann's idea of uh, crisis, the idea of what is a crisis being a conscious political and policy choice um, because it determines how we approach it and what we do to resolve it. And this, I think, is the, the very exciting challenge that you're facing today. I'm sorry that I won't be there with you to... to um, argue through the arguments, uh, discuss through the discussions, but um, I think this is actually what, you, what you're what you facing. It's tremendously exciting, and I really wish you well on uh, moving ahead with that. So thank you very much, uh, Radhika, and everyone there, and good luck with uh, the rest of your discussion today. Thank you so much, Hugh. I think he has laid the foundation very beautifully on what we are going to discuss and where we are.
in discussing the foundations of learning and going beyond what our original definitions are. Uh, we'll move over to the ministerial panel. If you can maybe get the slides up, um, asking um, Leslie to uh, please come over, Leslie, along with the ministers. Um, Leslie Udwin is uh, is a uh, you you can't miss her because she her thoughts will stay on. Once she speaks, I am sure there will be many thoughts that will stay on. And my first interaction with her was with this movie India's Daughter, and that interaction I have never been able to forget. Did right now. Uh, won uh, 32 awards and has in, uh, in, including the Peabody Award and the Amnesty International Media Award uh, uh, for the best documentary in 2016. And uh, she has really been insightful in uh, making girls' education possible um, and doing a lot on early childhood education. So no other, she is the best person to talk about foundational literacy. Uh, she is also voted by the New York Times as number two most impactful woman of 2015, second to Hillary Clinton, and has been awarded the most prestigious um, Swedish Anna, uh, Anna Lynn Human Rights Prize, previously also won by Magdalene Albright. So she's really the best person to take us forward in this journey uh, discussing uh, foundational li uh, literacy. Leslie, please. Your Excellencies, cherished friends and colleagues, welcome. I'm really deeply honored to be back here again this year on the mighty wings of Mission 4.7 and its truly brilliant leadership and team. I'm particularly honored to be moderating this panel of exceptionally enlightened education ministers who are leading the world by example because of their fundamental understanding that goal 4.7 quality education and drilling further down goal 4.2 foundational education in the early brain building years are the very engine room for progress and for sustainable development. So we are here at the midway point to achieving Agenda 2030. It's a familiar place for me because I too am at the midway point of my life, give or take, uh, plus minus. Um, and it is actually an extraordinary vantage point. Looking back seven years, We've achieved an extraordinary amount. And that has been galvanized by these SDGs, which have been remarkable in uniting us. If I look back at just one organization, Think Equal, the organization I know best, the one I founded, seven years ago, this movement and program, which is actually part of the education task force of Mission 4.7, and a flagship early years program, which mediates social emotional learning for well-being, for psychosocial support and social justice. Seven years ago, we were in one language, in 20 classrooms, in each of five countries. Now, seven years on, we're in 28 languages, in 30 countries, and in four of those 30 countries. This program is at full saturation because the enlightened education ministers have incorporated it into the national curriculum. And two of those remarkably enlightened education ministers are on this panel. So thus they have mandated this critical learning for education for sustainable development for every single child across their whole countries. And three more countries are standing by eager to do exactly the same as soon as we have found funding for them to do so. And I can't use that word without mentioning, indeed screaming from rooftops, 
the name Jennifer Gross, who is on the high level committee of Mission 4.7, who single handedly has funded a whole country to receive this revolutionary and critical learning. And a gentleman called David Suddens, who similarly has funded another country. And as if that isn't optimistic enough, even countries like the one I'm based in, the UK, who will not mandate anything, which I have to frankly say, I consider to be a derogation of duty. I consider that to be a neglect of our children if we don't mandate what they need. Even in countries like that, teachers are taking what they need and whole cities, districts, regions, Greater Manchester, 35,000 children learning this critical education. So the remarkable thing I have to mention about that particular rollout in Greater Manchester is this is being funded not by philanthropists, not by the education ministry, but by the National Health Service of England, by the Violence Prevention Unit of the police. Isn't that remarkable? That is progress. So we have achieved an enormous amount within civil society, all of us uniting, and you, the warriors who fight for planet, people, and civilization. But we need now, coming back to that vantage point, we need to more than redouble our efforts because we know how fast these last seven years have just flown by. H.G. Wells said, civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. Now the critical question which this panel we hope will answer is what kind of education will avert that catastrophe that we know is in our midst, has already begun. I'd like to invite your excellencies, please. Honorable ministers in person, Minister Saki from Sierra Leone, Honorable Minister. Henderson from Dominica and online, we are thrilled to welcome Honorable Minister Claudiana Cole from Gambia. Honorable Minister Pineda from El Salvador. and Your Excellency Honorable Minister Costa from Portugal. And so, to our first question, in the general global context of multiplying and compounding catastrophes, loss of learning due to the COVID pandemic, out of school learning due to wars, due to climate crises. And the second pandemic, which the World Health Organization warned us of, the mental health pandemic, where one in five of our children are suffering from mental health disorders. Please tell us, your excellencies, in each of your countries, what approaches are you taking? And please, may we start with Your Excellency, Minister Costa. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, extremely exciting event. And uh, I'd like to greet everyone, and in particular, my fellow members of this panel, ministers. Um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, 
when I think of what we can do and what we have been doing here in Portugal about about these uh, these issues, about the response to the pandemic, about the response to the mental health crisis, about the response to the new challenges that we are facing as humanity uh, altogether, uh, what 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 uh, bothers me most is that many times these questions are are, are phrased as either we do literacy or numeracy or we do social emotional competencies or either we do a knowledge-based curriculum or we do a whole child approach to the curriculum but these things do not have to be disjunctive uh, uh, the best way in my view and according to the policy that we've been developing here in portugal for almost eight years now the best way to put it is uh, we need it all we need to uh, learn all children to read, to write, to communicate verbally uh, with the fluency, to learn a foreign, one or two foreign languages, to learn mathematics, geography, chemistry. So all the knowledge that they have to acquire and develop through, throughout their years of schooling, but also at the same time, and not as an alternative, we need to take care of the whole of the child. And when we think of the challenges that we've been facing, like uh, uh, what happened to the pandemic, when we see that there were there were losses in learning, but there is a a, a huge uh, a huge impact on mental health in adults and children, not only in children, also in the adults and in a general climate that we that we live in society. Uh, we see that uh, for better learning, we have to know that it's not only the brain that goes to school. It's the brain, it's the whole body, it's the heart, it's the emotions, it's a whole child. And therefore, uh, 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 addressing the issue of mental health, not only as a clinical matter, but as a, a, a commitment to creating schools where one feels well, uh, where one feels valued, where self-esteem, where care about the other are central, uh, it will be a very important tool to have social emotional skills as a tool for better learning, but also as a goal of learning. When we learn in school, we learn all the traditional subjects, but we also learn how to uh, master our emotions, how to regulate ourselves, how to think creatively, how to think critically, and this is uh, this is of utmost urgency in the times that we are living. And we see that. Let me just give you two or three examples. I often said during the pandemic that the pandemic didn't bring. Uh, this may shock some of you. The pandemic didn't bring anything new to the education system. Uh, it it only acted as a, a magnifying lens. All the issues that we knew were there already, but they became very evident and in a in a in a worldwide scale so we already knew that uh, disadvantaged kids were being left behind in most of our countries it became more obvious because not having access to school prevented school as a filter for detection of many problems for these children we are already knew that we needed to adapt to the digital world uh, and all of a sudden it was evident for everyone that we needed remote learning and computers and technology in the schools. We already knew that uh, well-being uh, is an important uh, dimension of school, but then it became evident for everyone that uh, we need to care of mental health and well-being and social emotional skills uh, for everyone. We already knew that there are many kids who only eat a hot meal, a decent meal, when they go to school. And when the schools close, we all have to find ways to provide meals to these children that were left that were left at home, confined at home during the lockdown. So let's not miss the opportunity that the pandemic gave us to put the focus where it should be put. Um, having having a, a, what we did here in Portugal was uh, before the pandemic to redefine our curriculum and to have a, 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 a competence-based curriculum uh, where knowledge is part, because uh, you cannot be competent if you lack the knowledge, but knowledge that is not uh, used in many dimensions 
and not explored to, to learn how to look around you and to interpret the world can be um, sometimes disposable. You learn some things, you memorize, you put them on an exam, and the next day you have forgotten. And when we look at our biggest challenges, we look at climate change, and we need knowledge in order to know how to cope with climate change. And we need knowledge in a less organized way than what we used to have. What is the subject of climate change? Is it uh, economics? Is it biology? Is it uh, uh, philosophy with all the ethical things that, uh, that uh, go around the topic of climate changes? We need a more flexible curriculum. We need a curriculum where the subjects talk to each other. We need more project-based learning so that we can interpret reality and be able to act on the basis of reality. And uh, this means that, uh, let me just give you another example and then I will, I will finish. Uh, our relation with uh, the avalanche of knowledge, of information, let me put it this way, we, we live in a world of information in an avalanche of information. How do we cope with this? What is, what is demanded from school and from the curriculum in this, uh, in this context? Uh, we need, uh, we need uh, to be able to navigate uh, knowing how to ask questions rather than knowing the right answers, which has been the focus of school for many, many years. We need to ask the right questions. We need to develop the way to use our scientific knowledge in order to uh, uh, express judgments about what we read. And again, we saw this during the pandemic. The amount of misinformation about vaccination, about masks, about the origin of the, of the virus. Uh, and we see that the more you are vulnerable to this, uh, the less skilled you are. So just a final word to say that uh, here in Portugal, we redesigned the curriculum so that it is about a broad set of competencies where uh, uh, mathematics is as important as critical thinking, as creative thinking. We developed a policy on inclusive education that is curriculum-based. So inclusion is not about a set of measures to be developed uh, in another school, in a special corner of the school, but it's about a whole child approach where the curriculum is sufficiently flexible to, uh, to adapt to the needs of individual child. And uh, 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 finally, we develop an, a national strategy for citizenship education, where the issues of human rights, democratic institutions, financial literacy, uh, uh, climate change, sustainability, gender equality are part of the foundational learnings. And these three pillars, curriculum, inclusion, and citizenship, only work out if they are developed together. And that's why project-based learning various learning became so important here. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the answer, please, of Your Excellency Minister Henderson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Present good morning, everyone, panelists, special invited guests. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to, at the outset, just to put out a disclaimer. I'm not the Minister of Education. <laughs> but I, I actually, I serve as Minister of Education for Dominica um, in an earlier term, but I also serve as Minister for Sustainable Development, Climate Resilience, and Renewable Energy. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, I should have something that I can contribute to the process. I want to first just get the context right. Dominica is a small island developing state, very small, very, very small, 73,000 at the last count. I suspect there are more Dominicans in New York than in Dominica. Mm -hmm. But um, we, so we have our peculiar challenges. Six years ago, actually, two days from today, will be six years since we were hit by the most devastating hurricane in our history, Hurricane Maria. And I'm saying this because I just want to really draw the context that in my constituency, the students at the primary school only were able to go back to the actual school building a week ago. So 
these students, very small primary school, rural community, the school got destroyed by the hurricane, thanks to the Canadian government who were able to re renovate that school and through our own local resources, were able to complete the school finally for the students to get access. So during those six years, they actually shared a facility with the, the high school, which created significant challenges. Every week, these students had lost about four hours of schooling, unfortunately. So it means, and I, and I, I use the opportunity to track their performance over this, these years and to see how that, you know, the outcomes prior to the hurricane, prior to COVID pandemic, which was added upon that. So they also had a layer of complexity there created by, by the COVID pandemic. So these students were actually losing school hours. Not only those from the primary school, but the secondary school, because in the shift system, there's a transitional period and both, both schools actually lost some vital hours. But in spite of these challenges, our government in the 2023-2024 budget, which was two months ago, actually presented a pretty ambitious goal of education reform. And that's why I'm happy to be here because quite of the learning, I, I am benefiting from this lecture because I have taken quite a bit of notes and I'm hoping that I could get some of the presentations, especially the one by, by you, so that I could be able to share with my colleague and the cabinet. It is the government's intention to pursue an inclusive process during this fiscal year to develop a curriculum which is more responsive to the challenges and new realities and what will prepare our children to take advantage of the opportunities which are available in Dominica, in the region, and the rest of the world. I speak, for example, about the advancements in the use of artificial intelligence, the digital economy, geothermal energy and other renewable energy, and its potential application for use in developing green products, the green hydrogen, green ammonia, and many others. We need to equip our students and our people with the skills to take advantage of these new opportunities. We believe with the reform of the education system, we can create a curriculum that produces a holistic, well-rounded child who is prepared for the future, a child who will not just survive, but one who can succeed and thrive in any condition, culture, or environment. So that is our goal, our aspiration as a government and as a people. But going back to the context of the small island developing state, it is the impact of climate change that is making it increasingly difficult for us. I visited a school, for example, um, say two weeks ago, a week ago, sorry. And they, we had the hottest summer on the record, and I guess every one of us had that. And I'm not sure how the kids were able to manage Back in school, thank God, the temperatures have, you know, dropped. But the challenges of being able to learn in that condition, and I'm sure perhaps the nearest school here is well equipped with cooling and heating systems. We don't have that. So, so it's not only losing the school, but it's also making it more difficult to, actual, to actually learn mm -hmm. in an environment that is conducive for learning. So we are really challenged in so many different areas. In addition to that, with the passage of every hurricane, investments that would have gone to improve the school system have to rebuild roads, bridges, restore electrical lines, and the list goes on and on. That notwithstanding, over the last 20 years, we have made the most advancements. And I, I was the Minister of Education, I must say, when we introduced universal secondary education in 2005. So just to get it again, the context, before 2005, every child in Dominica did not have access to a secondary school. Every child. There was a terminal path that they would choose, which would take them to technical vocational training because, and they would have had to go through a process of selection and if you were not able to score high enough, then you you were, well, you would move on to a path of strictly technical vocational schooling for the next 
for three years, actually three years of schooling. We also had a system where teachers were not trained before entering the classroom. And again, I had the, the pleasure of presiding over the reforms that saw just before the creation of the of a, of a post-secondary institution, the State College, where we started training teachers to ensure that prior to going to the classroom, they are trained. And those already in the classroom, we had we, we had got them trained. So we are now getting to the point where every teacher in the classroom is certified and trained. So bringing in this new, one should say, approach to learning will require for us significant resources and retraining, which is the most important thing. Fortunately, we have trained so many teachers and so many of our students. Some of them have actually been to, to the hall of this, this um, respected institution. So we have the benefit of having the human capacity to bring that transformation and the reform in education. And I'm hoping it will include focusing on sustainable development, but more so resilience building, because for us, we cannot develop, not even sustainably, without being able to survive the impact of the effects of climate change, especially the meteorological events. We've had so many of them, so many severe floods and hurricanes, storms that continue to make it very challenging. We set the goal in 2017 of becoming a climate resilient nation. And we have made significant strides since. And I'm very happy that even on the, as part of my, my ministry, we are getting ready to begin construction of a geothermal power plant, which will be able to transform the generation of power from fossil fuel to renewable sources. This will add to already 30% production of hydroelectricity. So we are, we are looking forward to using those as opportunities for learning and to ensure that this could become an essential part of our curriculum at our schools as we seek to transform our education system. Thank you, Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Minister Cole. Claudiana, can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Uh, I'll unmute. Wonderful. You're with us. You're with us. Thank you. Please. Deliver. You're welcome. You're welcome, Les. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from the Gambia. It is my pleasure to be joining this meeting virtually. Yes, uh, virtual meetings or hybrid meetings are becoming the order of the day. Uh, no longer can anybody or anyone have the, the excuse to say, oh, I couldn't travel, or I, that's why I couldn't join. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to be there in person and we're sitting beside you, Les. But then, unfortunately, it couldn't uh, happen that way. But nonetheless, I'm pleased, I'm very pleased to be joining this meeting, meeting and to be listening to you, Leslie, and all the other speakers. Here we are, we are talking about foundational learning, emotional uh, learning, et cetera, et cetera. Last September, I was in New York where we discussed the transforming education agenda. And since I came back home to the Gambia, a small country in West Africa, but a very dynamic country, and uh, we are very, very much interested in improving the standard of education in this country, the Gambia, and uh, to make sure that uh, the only resource that we have in the Gambia, unfortunately, the Gambia does not have natural resources. And uh, our main resource is the people. And so we are trying to develop the people to be able to contribute effectively to the SDGs. 
Yes, last when you started, you spoke about uh, emotional learning, if I can recall. And uh, that drew my mind to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. The emotional needs, the psychological needs, the physical needs, the social needs. And for that reason, when we developed our education policy for 2016 to 2030, we thought of having the theme as uh, providing accessible, inclusive, equitable, and quality education for lifelong learning. And here we are also looking at uh, what we've been hearing so much these days, leaving no one behind. It's, uh, it's our intention not to leave any child of school going age behind. And uh, so irrespective of what their locations are, what their physical uh, abilities are, what their backgrounds are, we want to bring all of them on board to be able to access education because it's a it's their right, it's a human right. And uh, we're not only thinking about giving them any type of education, but quality education, which is equitable. And so throughout the length and breadth of the country, we want to have every child in every school uh, accessing equitable and quality education. And so to be able to do that, we had to strengthen, we had a pronouncement in the present education policy, 2016 to 2030, that we're going to strengthen early childhood education. And I think when we talk about foundational learning, there is where it rests. ECD, early childhood education. And so in all our lower basic schools, government lower basic schools, the public lower basic schools, we do have private schools. And uh, for a long time, early childhood education was left in the hands of private providers. And because of that, we saw some inequalities in the performances of the, of the children, of our students. And so when we did some research, we conducted some studies, we found out that uh, what we thought was true was actually true that because uh, the children, we are not all receiving early childhood education, Whereas that was being provided in the private schools, in the public schools, our students were coming particularly in the, in the rural areas because uh, ECD education uh, provision by the, by the private providers was mainly in the urban area. And in the rural areas, there, there was nothing like that because it was uh, being paid for. It was in free, ECD was in free by the private providers. And uh, because there was poverty in the rural areas, the parents could not afford to pay for early childhood education. And so the children went to school in the public schools straight from home. At the age of six, they would get into the first grade. Whereas in the urban area, the children were having three years of early childhood education, uh, which means they started ECD at the age of three and uh, they got into grade one at the age of six. And we all know that those first three years uh, or the, the, the second three years of uh, uh, somebody's life, of children's life, very important developmental stage. And so it contributed to the type of education that they received. And I have known for a long time uh, because I started teaching uh, very early, since the early 80s. And in the first school where I taught, my headmistress would not admit any child who hadn't been to an ECD center or nursery school as we called it. 
And because of that, that school where I taught, where my headmistress would not admit any child who had not gone through early childhood development, the standard and quality of education was quite high compared to schools where the children went straight from home into grade one. And uh, in such schools, the standard of education was uh, not, not very impressive. So I had known that for a long time. And so in 2016, when we developed the present education policy, it was in there pronounced that every public school will have an ECD class attached to prepare the children for grade one. And that was the one step we took towards addressing the SDGs 4.11, which talks about quality education for all. And since we did that, we have seen that the quality of education has started improving in our country. Uh, foundational learning. As the name implies, foundation. What is a foundation for? When you talk about building, the foundation is the first thing and it has to be strong. It has to be strengthened. If you want a strong house built, if you want a house that would, would stand the test of times, you need to have a strong foundation. And so it is with learning. You need to have a strong foundation, a strong numeracy and literacy skills or knowledge. Because I have attended several capacity building workshops and I could remember as a young teacher, I once had attended a workshop, teacher capacity building, which talked about uh, uh, teaching English across the curriculum. If you may want to know, English is the official language of the Gambia. And uh, all our teachings in our schools are conducted, we, we, we use English as the medium of, of instruction. It's only now that we have started thinking about using local languages in the early grades to strengthen learning. But we have always been using English as the language of instruction in our schools because it's the official language. And this workshop that I, uh, that I attended in the early 80s talked about teaching English across the curriculum because every subject that was being taught in our classrooms was taught in English, whether it was mathematics, whether it was, uh, it was science, whether it was uh, 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 history, whatever, all the subjects were taught in English. So we were we, we trained as to how to ensure that the children's literacy knowledge or ability was strong from an early age because that is what they needed to learn throughout their, 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 their schooling. So literacy skills, numeracy skills, to be able to understand the, 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 the value of numbers, to be able to understand how you can use number values in percentages, in fractions, in uh, whatever that you are going to, uh, whatever topic you're going to be dealing with in mathematics. The children need to have a knowledge of numeracy and literacy at that strong foundational level, ECD level or early primary, which is grade one, two, three. And of late, we started hearing about learning poverty. What is learning poverty? Because learning poverty, from my understanding, is uh, the children in our schools have not been able to reach their targets, their learning achievement targets. We call it the LATS, learning achievement targets. What they were supposed to learn in those early formative years, to be able to help them, to learn as they go through the upper grades, they were not able to do because of many reasons, crisis, wars, environmental uh, issues, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Pandemics. And uh, in our age recently, we, 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 we experienced one of the worst 
pandemics in our age, the uh, COVID. And all those, because in the Gambia, schools were closed for about six months. The children were not going to school and sitting in their classrooms. But we, in the Gambia, my ministry, we knew, we realized that learning couldn't wait. The children could not have sat at home for as long as it took because we were never even told how long the schools were going to be closed for. So we thought the children cannot wait. Learning couldn't wait. And so what did we do? We took the school to their homes. How did we take the school to the homes? We took the school to the homes by providing virtual classes for the children at home through the television, for those who had television, for uh, through radio uh, uh, sets, for, th for those who had radio sets in their homes, online and offline. We use all those methods. And we were able to, to determine that by looking at the household survey, how many people had access to television in the Gambia? How many households had access to a radio set? And how many households also had access to at least one uh, mobile phone? And when we had the figures, then we decided that we were going to use all three mediums to be able to continue to provide learning to the children while they were at home. So all these challenges have taught us that we need to have a transformational agenda for education. And so since I came back from uh, the Transforming Education Summit, we have been working on these, how to transform education because it's no longer business as usual. We cannot continue to provide education to our, our, our nations the way we have been doing it. Chalk and board, uh, teacher centered, no. Now we say it should be child centered learning. And if it's going to be child centered learning, we need to think of the methodologies that we are going to be using to make it child centered learning. And uh, for that reason, we have also, I have continuously been telling my teachers, we are not teaching children anymore. We are facilitating their learning. And we, we can do that whether we are in the classroom or out of the classroom. The children can continue to learn. And uh, we have an app that we have introduced to our schools, the iLearn, and uh, that means Children can learn anywhere, everywhere, at any time, wherever they are, they can continue to learn. And so we have an app that uh, our children are using called the iLearn. They can learn at home, they can learn on their farms, they can learn wherever they are, they can continue to learn. Not only in the classroom anymore, COVID has definitely taught us that, that learning, does not only take place in the classroom, it can take place anywhere. So these are the ways that we are trying to transform education. And uh, yes, of late, like I said, we are looking at different ways. And uh, we have come to realize that if we must embrace digital learning, we are in the age of technology, we need to be able to have connections in our schools. Our schools need to be connected to the internet. And so we are working on that, getting all our schools connected and uh, we, so that we can be able to use as much virtual learning techniques such as is possible. And all this about, is about re-emerging education. We have to re-emerge education, not the old way, but to be able to adopt new ways of learning. And we are also, or we have just recently uh, reviewed our curriculum, transform, uh, reform the curriculum. We had a curriculum uh, reform just recently because so much has happened 
since we, we, we developed the curriculum in 2016 to now. And uh, moreover, we have reached midway of that, uh, of that uh, policy, sorry. We have reached midway of the policy 2016 to 2030. And from 2016 to 2022 or 2023, a lot has happened that has told us that we have to re-imagine education service delivery. We have to transform how we provide education. So Thank you, we're Your Excellency. Curriculum. We're going to wrap up just because we're running out of time. Thank you for yes. those wonderful insights. Um, and we will move on now uh, to Minister Pineda. Is she going to wrap yes, up, Leslie? Mm -hmm. yes. so go ahead. Yes, I just go wanted ahead. to wrap up to say we have re reviewed the curriculum to address competencies, skills, and the knowledge to respond to the 21st century requirements, creating inquiry minds in our learners to discover knowledge for themselves and not be spoon fed so that they are able to compete uh, with their peers, with their colleagues all over the world, and they will become global citizens in education. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, Minister Pineda. Thank you, Leslie. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, to all uh, the audience in, in this forum, a special greetings for my colleagues, uh, honorable ministers of education um, in the table and, and also in a virtual way. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, for everybody uh, assisting to this forum, uh, we will agree that the pandemic was a forceful reminder that a single-handedly brought to light the great gaps and inequities that still persist in our educational system. Um, so I think it's time to start this, seeing uh, that pandemic as an opportunity for all our educational system and not start thinking or continue thinking on uh, reinstalling the way that we knew our educational system previously, but to accelerate, to improve uh, the, the way that we were having our educational system previously, the pandemic. Still, there are gaps, I'm pretty sure, I'm talking uh, basically about my country, but uh, I'm pretty sure uh, it, it is mostly the same thing in most countries or, or many countries all around the, the globe. But I'm pretty sure that uh, there are still gaps in learning, in infrastructure, in access to uh, quality educations, in guaranteeing the right to the education, and of course, in access to technology. The pandemic, the way I see, gave rise to truly heroic acts uh, and responses by our teachings and uh, the technical staff of our countries. This ensure educational continuity for millions of students. The pandemic also made us to come together with family to work on the education of new generations. And from my vantage point, this uh, shed light on fundamental issues that we will do well to reflect more on and learn more from. I am referring to the need to strengthen public schools public assets, and to ensure that in the coming years, we respond from a sustainable public policy perspective with universal vocations and commitment to equity and to overcoming inequities. This is only serious way to address education, equity, and educational inclusion. Based on this universal and right-based approach, we understand that it's not possible to advance in the cognitive aspect of learning unless there is a solid social emotional foundation. In our view, social emotional skills 
are fundamental for learning to take place. This is why we have taken care to train our teachers to, to create spaces to meet their needs because only students and teachers who are properly motivated, joyful, and encouraged uh, to learn and to read, to calculate, to think critically and autonomously. We have made the development of social emotional skills an integral part of the entire national curriculum. Nevertheless, this new stage of mind in education must have an impact on the school. Laying the foundation for transforming the school involves transforming the pedagogical practices of teachers. The role of principals and the relationship students have with the teachers and the educational community. If we do not install a new way of managing learning in the classroom, in the schools, and in the edu educational territory, we will not be able to build a new school. The new Salvadoran school, we not only have better infrastructure, we have been working since we started this government on refurbishing all our schools, but we also have better educational processes. For that reason, one of the central tasks of the educational system during the reform we are promoting, Mi Nueva Escuela, is to define clear and concrete roadmap that will enable us to achieve a competencies and learning today a society requires. Without overlooking national values and our own identity as people. That is why we want our new school to be based on a, on a new educational model and to deploy a new pedagogical model. In order to address that, the learning gap to accelerate the learning is not enough to have a new curriculum. In the school, in the classroom, and in all the educational venues, more dynamic, more positive, less authoritarian relationships needs to appear, to take place and to be unleashed. This is the only way we can encourage students to develop the competence and autonomous work that is so fundamental in these times. This ability to carry a process autonomously is the basis of the critical thinking and of the skills needed to be citizen as well. We all know that learning to read and write well competently is what leads to other learning. However, this is truncated, hindered, unless there is a new environment in the school. That is why we consider that the pedagogical model is the key for fundamental learning to move forward. Uh, that, that are my thoughts for uh, the first question, Leslie. Thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you so much. And last, but by no means least, Your Excellency, Minister Saki. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank you for according me this privilege to speak to this important topic. Um, secondly, I also... Um, I, I also just want to state how delighted I am to be here today. As I'm the last speaker, please permit me to first of all just recap what the question was. So the question, <laughs> as I understand it, is considering the global context of multiple compounding crises in the world, What have been some ways in which foundational learning has been approached in your country to respond to the needs of the current global context? Before, rather than going into the global crises that are taking place around the world, please permit me to be local. So permit me to share with you the Sierra Leonean experience Sierra Leone is a very small country, but we've had a share of shocks. 11 years of civil war. Many people lost their lives. The infrastructure was destroyed. Teachers were killed. 
some escaped and went to other countries. And because the grass was so green in these countries, never came back. But we started to build back. Unfortunately, we had a knock on the door and we had Ebola. Two years of which thousands lost their lives. We've also had our share of natural disasters. We had an incident of mudslide which killed about 3,000 people. As if that was not enough, we've had periodic flooding, which has reminded us that if we do not take care of our own environment, our Mother Earth, we will suffer the consequences. But everybody in this room had the similar experience in COVID. And so, in terms of our response to foundational learning, I would like to look at it from two perspectives. Firstly, the gaps that we have been trying to fill. The second, I will also want to look at it um, within how the, the, the prism or the lenses that we have used to deal with some of these crises. But before I do so, please permit me to just give you a rough definition of how we see foundational learning. So the starting point in the preamble of our policy says we are committed to take action to improve foundational learning outcomes for all children in our country. I am going to stress on the word all, universal, rights-based both those that have and those that have not, those in the rural, the rural poor and the urban deprived, men, boys, as well as girls, and so on and so forth. So all, all children should learn to read fluently with comprehension. So now we start to speak to the issue of learning poverty. Acquire foundational numeracy competencies, develop resilient socio-emotional skills. And we are adding one more thing to it. In order to bridge our past to our future, we also want our kids to harness digital educational skills. So that's how we see foundational learning. So quickly, let me tell you about the gaps. So in terms of the um, learning poverty, numeracy and literacy, in our lexicon, our educational lexicon, we call it um, comprehension and um, computational skills. That's how we frame it within our curriculum. So the other gap that we had was that we noticed that the first class in a primary school, that's where you have more people repeating because you have a wide range of young people who come to that class. Those who are three-year-olds, those who are nine-year-olds. And it's very difficult as a teacher to be able to teach in that sort of setting. So we have made a decision that we will offer pre-primary education to all of our young people. Unfortunately, we do not have enough money to cover the three years of pre-primary school. So government has made a commitment that we will cover one year at age five for all of our young people. Why? Because we believe that by so doing, we will make them ready to learn. We will address the issue of repetition in that first class. We will reduce the teacher-pupil ratio, because if you have these kids coming through, then you have a wider flow of, of, of young people. So those two things address the gaps. But let's look at it. How have we responded to the crises that we have in the system? One is socio-emotional skills. And let me just very quickly, I know time is running out, but let me just quickly say what our socio-emotional skills are addressing. 
One, to manage emotions. Two, set and achieve positive goals. Three, appreciate the perspectives of others. Four, establish and maintain supportive relationships. Five, make responsible decisions. And last, but by no means the least, six, handle personal and interpersonal situations constructively. We intended that this will be embedded in the in other subjects rather than being taught as a distinct um, subject. But perhaps by the time I leave this room, I would have had another option. Not so? Oh, yes. <laughs> 100%. Okay. So the last, by the means the least, the other ways we have addressed some of the challenges that we have been faced with throughout our curriculum in all levels of education, we have civic education. This is where we teach our young people what it is or what it looks like to be a good citizen. It starts off with your relationship with your family, and then it moves out, your community, and then it moves further out, your city, your town, your district, and then nationally. But as we all know, we live in a small village. So we know that our kids might want to move outside of Sierra Leone. So we teach them about global citizenship. But in all of that, we start to teach them to take care of their community, reminding them of the experiences that we've had. And also how to be tolerant to one another, reminding them of our past in terms of the civil war. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you all, Your Excellencies, for those incredibly inspiring words, those eloquent words of wisdom. Um, Radhika spoke of Hugh McLean, her strict editor. I'm afraid she has learned how to do that from him. And now I have a strict editor in <laughs> Radhika. And unfortunately, we have run out of time. So we're not going to be able, Your Excellencies, please, please forgive me, um, to... Uh, answer the second question, which was so important about the how. We know what the what is, but if I may just very briefly sum up, we know that the answer to that question we posed before the panel began, what kind of education is going to avert catastrophe? The answer is not that model of education designed in and for the industrial revolution, which is no longer fit for purpose, of cognitive learning only. No, the answer is the whole child, as everybody here has, has said, that's been a common theme. It is that education that Article 29 of the Convention of the Rights of the Child requires us to give our children as their right education to be directed to the whole personality of the child and to give them the foundation for positive life outcomes. Unfortunately, we can't talk about the how, but I need to say, because I live and breathe this every second of my life, we have to mandate this. It's not enough to have lists of outputs and competencies. We need the tools in the teacher's hands in that classroom. And there are a number of countries who have begun to do that in earnest with total commitment. I've never been more optimistic. We will nurture the next generation of empathetic, loving, responsible global citizens and the next generation of leaders. Thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie, and the panelists, ministers. Grateful for this opportunity. Um, since we are running out of time, I just wanted to invite uh, Mr. Giovanni Basu. He's the deputy director UNHCR, uh, just to provide a brief glimpse or highlights of his work, since he has to go for another UN meeting, all of our schedules are packed. I don't want to miss the opportunity of having him here and not be able to speak. Mr. Vasu, please. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And it's a real honor to be here representing UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Excellencies, it's been a real pleasure listening and learning. Now, talking about UNHCR's work in education, we've just released a report on this. So let me give you a very top line breakdown of what the report said. First, the Ukraine conflict that has caused the number of school age refugees to nearly double, up to 50% by the end of last year. Now, we've reached a number of 14.8 million refugee children compared to 10 million a year earlier, which was already a very high figure. Now, this is the worst statistics, that out of this large total, 51% are estimated to be out of school, meaning that 7 million refugee children are currently missing out on SDG 4. And actually, the further up the educational ladder we go, the steeper this decline. So when we look at tertiary education, we're looking at only 6% of refugee children having access to tertiary education. But really, at all levels, the enrollment for refugees lags far behind national averages. But I really don't want to be doom and gloom because actually there have been advances in various countries. Many countries have actually stepped up on access to refugees to their educational system. So let me give you a few highlights. We have recently had Lebanon that introduced the Reaching All Children with Education program for Syrian refugees. Elsewhere, Poland, and Colombia completely retailed their refugee, uh, their national education program for the specific requirements of Ukrainian and Venezuelan refugees, uh, respectively, and amid a crisis, a large inflow of refugees from the Central African Republic into Cameroon, that country welcomed refugee children into their schools, despite the development challenges that they were facing. Also, Uganda and Rwanda stand out for their ref efforts at giving access to education to refugee children. But one thing is access, okay? Now, access is a precondition, but we really also have to look at the quality of education that is provided and the pertinence of the education provided. Now, Quality is an issue that affects all children, not just refugee children. But let's remember where most refugee children are hosted. Three quarters are hosted by low and middle income countries, which already face development challenges and challenges in providing quality education for all. Now, giving access to an underfunded educational system will really not provide quality education to refugee children or to anyone for that matter. Now, the other point I mentioned was the pertinence of education. And within that, I think there is the important idea of how to foster resilience for refugee children and other marginalized youth. Now, really on the issue of resilience, I actually think that refugee children are incredibly resilient as it is, having lived through what they've had to live through at their young age. But really, it's not automatically so. So I think an essential component of refugee education programming that we've learned from our work in the field is, you know, refugees very often arrive with trauma because of what they've lived through. And this has to be worked through whilst they're gaining access to school. So really, most access to education for refugee programs should include strong psychosocial components. Now, another key ingredient to good refugee education programming that we're finding is that we need to feed back the experience of refugee children to other students to strengthen empathy and to kind of broaden this understanding of resilience to the other children. Now, another interesting issue that we've been working with is refugee teachers. 
Now, refugee teachers can really incorporate the issue of resilience into their teaching, but they also know how to manage complex and difficult classrooms. And really, you know, schools in refugee hosting areas very often are. And another related point that I wanted to mention is that, yes, refugee children can bring, bring that complex classroom scenario kind of experience, but actually, really, this needs to be something that's mainstreamed in all teacher professional development programs to you know, explicitly address ways in which schools can be made safer and more inclusive for all groups, um, including refugee children. Now, maybe, and I think a few speakers have already mentioned it, the last point on pertinence is digital access. Now, it's very unfortunate that refugee hosting schools and communities are often excluded from national digital learning initiatives. And this has really resulted in a massive gap, the digital divide that really further marginalizes this community as they are less likely to be equipped with the digital skills that they need to succeed in what is an you know, increasingly digital world. So to sum up, providing access to education to all refugee children remains key but really, we have to go further into this, and we must also prioritize the quality of education and the pertinence of the education provided. And, you know, both quality and pertinence comes at a price. And given that most of refugee children are in low- and middle-income countries, well, they really can't be left alone to shoulder the responsibility of providing access to education alone, right? And I think. A number of speakers have mentioned resources and national budgets. And in our view as UNHCR, in return for providing refugee access, these states must really be given predictable multi-year support from global and regional financial institutions, high income states and the private sector. And they currently really do not. And this is something I really, really hope will start changing tomorrow as we start the SDG summit and my very last point is a great big thank you to columbia university because they are one of the few who have a scholarship for displaced students now we really need many many more of these for refugee students not to face that glass ceiling after primary school thank you very much Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Basu, and it was an honor to hear your thoughts. And uh, luckily, we were able to catch you in time uh, before you head for your uh, other meetings. The question that was left on the previous panel was how? How do we do it? So I think this panel, which is the technical panel, will be able to address the question uh, adequately, uh, actually much more adequately. Can I ask uh, our technical panelists to uh, please join us? Also. Robert Jenkins, our moderator. Um, Robert Jenkins is the Director of Education and Adolescent Development Program Group in UNICEF, and he joined UNICEF in 1995, and he brings over 20 years of experience uh, in the field. Um, he's worked in Jordan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, Uganda, and many, many more countries, uh, Mozambique. Uh, so thank you, uh, Rob, for being here. Uh, just wanted to start this discussion by a reflection on this book, Ethics in Action for Sustainable Development. Uh, it is um, by Professor Jeffrey Sachs and uh, others, Jesse Thorson, and it started, this discussion of this ethics and sustainable development started with uh, uh, a discussion that happened in Vatican uh, 2016. And uh, this uh, book really stuck me with the idea of having ethics in everything that we do. So I just wanted to start this dialogue by asking uh, Robert Jenkins, our moderator, on the question of sustainable development and ethics. In your experience, in your vast experience of 20 years, how have you seen ethics being a part of your work and ethics being integrated into uh, education for sustainable development? 
Yeah, great. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, thanks for the question. Absolutely critical. You know, I um, I think we have to recognize school systems are some are in general, we're all here committed to enabling kids to be in school and attend school, quality education, et cetera. But we also absolutely have to recognize what type of schooling they're getting and what values and ethics and and uh, social norms, if you like, are they um, learning or um, being exposed to? And um, I know we've all, I'm sure, been in many classrooms in which you can see such positive um, messaging and promotion of global international norms in terms of ethics being promoted in the way, the substance that's being taught, but also the way it's being taught and the way children are interacting. And unfortunately, we've also seen the opposite. Um, and increasingly, you may argue, well, it depends if the glass is half full or glass is half empty, but definitely it continues to be a very real challenge. In the end, I think what matters is leadership. We need leadership in governments, in the UN system, in partners, in schools, in classrooms. We need to take bold decisions to push back on certain social norms and ethics that are not um, within sort of um, in line with international principles and put forward those that are. I think that's the bottom line. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Do you want me to pivot now to, great. Um, okay, well, thanks. I um, uh, had the great pleasure to um, welcome our esteemed panelists. As mentioned, my name is Rob Jenkins. I did uh, have a bit of a New York story this morning. Those of you who don't live here may benefit. I was in an earlier panel on the uh, in the UN system um, and I had committed to that, but then it went a little bit late and I knew it was gonna be tight. But then those of you who have been on the east side of uh, Manhattan in the last few hours will know they have completely shut down the entire city um, because we have DVIPs coming there. Um, and so that did mean I ended up after much yelling and screaming and running coming by bicycle here. <laughs> um, yeah. On a city bike. Actually, my dear friend Uma said, how are you gonna make it? And I'm like, I I have 30 minutes, but it turned out I had 15 and then I came out and it was just, uh, so um, back to sort of ethics and norms. I did break some laws coming here in terms of the red lights. Oh. Anyways, um, this is a technical uh, discussion. And so I am gonna encourage our panelists to be technical. And what I mean by that is, I think um, we should almost be ready to put our hand up and go, uh -uh, if anyone says sort of a truism, you know, the importance of education, the importance that refugees are included in education systems, the importance that we address barriers that girls face. Sorry, I've been around this block enough to just, we have heard all of that before. So how about if anybody disagrees on those statements, I think you're in the wrong meeting. <laughs> so let's not say things like that, especially because we are in a technical discussion. So there are a lot of trade-offs, really tough things that we need to work on. So let's seize this opportunity right now to wrestle those and try and find the right balances and ultimately find some great best practices. All right, I clearly did not make a good moderator because I'm supposed to just ask questions. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're gonna do a firing uh, round first. It's really just a 30 seconds, one minute. It's like a sentence or two to a general question. And then as you all know, you're gonna have a chance to come back on a much more in-depth question. But just to maybe go straight with my dear friend, Joe, and we'll go straight down here. The first question that you all answered, um, and thanks for all the support for colleagues that have put this together. But the question is that considering the global context of multiple compounding crises that I know we all know and live very much, what do you think is required right now? Um, what would you say is the number one priority that we should be focusing in on to drill to deal with these multiple crises in order to accelerate foundational learning? What's the one thing, Joe? And then we'll pass down. I'm going to give three. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> but I'll yeah. be quick. And I'm going to start by saying, you know, absolutely. You're, we've heard so many great comments this morning and similarities around what nations aspire for in terms of rounded citizens. So I won't repeat all of that, although I will say that on top of all of the critical thinking, communication, um, et cetera, tackling the epidemic of violence against women has not been mentioned. And so that also means that we need to 
be looking at skills to recognize and challenge harmful social norms. That was at the end of my long list of all the other things that I haven't said, right? I think what we're struggling with, though, is it's probably true to say that very few education systems are truly delivering on these broader aspirations that they have in their curriculum at, at the policy level. Um, because to do so requires the ability to change in a very complex education system. And it is, as we've heard, curriculum, it's pedagogy, it's materials and assessment, it's political and community buy-in, it's leadership, which you've just mentioned. So coming back to the foundational skills piece, um, what does that mean in terms of, you know, broad aspiration and difficult implementation? So what is required of foundational learning in that space? So I think the first one, we've already said it, I think we do need to recognize foundational learning is more than literacy and numeracy. Um, the transfers, trans, the transferable skills such as social and emotional support, et cetera, yeah. also important. Uh, secondly, that even if we do see countries taking a narrower view or we have agencies supporting a narrower view, the reality is that education systems are struggling to deliver and they're certainly struggling to deliver for all children. Um, and many children therefore being deprived of even those first steps to reading with understanding, expressing oneself in writing, all of the things that we heard about um, earlier. So therefore I think we have an opportunity and the opportunity is actually to make use of a strategic focus on foundational learning in the slightly broader sense that we've talked about as an entry point or as a catalyst to change systems. Because systems are so big, you're not going to change everything all at once. They just get tied up in knots. But actually having some kind of vehicle where you can start to say, OK, this is the goal that we want. These are the implementation bottlenecks to get there. And they could be big policy bottlenecks like language we heard about this morning, or they could be right down at the classroom face where teachers are struggling to turn up because they haven't got transport. But these are the implementation bottlenecks to deliver on this aspiration that we have. Um, and then use that pathway to drive system change. So I'll end by saying, as you all know, a lot of what we've been doing in GP is working behind our partners. We don't say this is your priority. We say, what is the priority and how can we help you use that priority to drive change through systems? I think most people are, or everyone's gonna agree with broader definition of foundational learning and also using foundational as an entry point for broader change. I think great points. Um, Rajiv, um, over to you, same question, just Thank to you. kick off. Uh, we are in an August gathering of edu uh, educators today, and unlike uh, a lot of people in this room, I don't come from a background in education. Uh, I learned about the true meaning of uh, foundational learning from the incredible Leslie Adwin, who you met earlier today. Now, Leslie's work uh, doesn't need any introduction. Uh, she's a global voice on equality. But before she became a global voice on equality, uh, she... Uh, was she was I say was because she was a prolific filmmaker who gave us one of the most important films of her time, uh, a, a film that exposed uh, uh, systemic discrimination and violence in society, and yet Leslie decided to stop making films. And I remember this conversation with her uh, where I asked why she stopped making films because clearly this is a film that impacted millions of people, including me. And her answer was, she said, to, to make change in society, you can't just have advertisement campaigns and films that stay with you for a short period of time. If you have to make a change in society, you need to have long-term radical shift in people's consciousness. And that, to me, is foundational learning. And that's the inspiration that I took for my work in Globe From Home. Uh, we teach climate education. And we realize that you can't just teach climate education by, by talking about facts and figures. It has to go beyond. It has to include an awareness of, of global cultures. It has to uh, include a global kinship and understanding of our oneness. And to be able to leverage that human oneness to then build a sustainable future. Uh, so that's that's my understanding of foundational learning, Robert. Thank you. Thanks, Rajiv. And I, I hopefully we're going to get time to talk about 
how do we measure that? And how, what does that look like? And I know we're, um, you've got some thoughts on that. Uma, over to you with the same question. Sure. Um, just to say that, because it hasn't been said at all today yet, um, that, you know, we still have a learning and skills crisis. It does present the greatest challenge of our time, that about 70% of 10-year-olds in low- and middle-income countries still can't understand a simple written text. I want to say that because we still have a major issue. But I don't want to repeat what everyone said in the morning, that we need these skills, but we need the broader set. We all agree this broader set of foundational skills for education, employment, and citizenship. And, and I think the other point I'd want to make is that we need to also keep in mind we are preparing young people for jobs that don't yet exist and to solve problems that we're not yet aware of. So our young people really need to be empowered with the kinds of skills um, they need to navigate in a really ever-changing world. And another point, you know, is the importance of digital literacy as part of foundational learning. I'd like to emphasize it was also highlighted by the previous speaker, speaker around migrant youth and what they need. And, you know, um, Rob, just before, just before um, we were talking about that, we didn't have enough time to talk about the how and lessons from the field and what we're learning from the field. And what we learned from the pandemic is with the increased digitization, we have initiatives that we know well, like the Learning Passport, Passport to Earning, that have really opened up a new world of resources and livelihood opportunities through platforms in the digital space for young people, where teachers, parents, and communities were taken along as part of the journey and really unlocked new opportunities, especially for young adolescent girls. And just a, another point, you know, that I that I'd want to make that is I think important. It's not just about preparing young people for the workforce, and it's not just about preparing young people for jobs. Um, it's also about preparing them for life, and that came up really strongly I think today. And just to emphasize that, and there are initiatives around the world, including the Global Volunteers Initiative, um, which is really through the pandemic you had young people on the front line. Um, dealing with the COVID response, or whether it's planting trees or stamping out polio. And now you see that in community service learning in schools. You see change in the curriculum. Young people are learning through their communities. So I think going to the question, what do we require? It's this flexible, holistic approach we're talking about. It'll help young people become lifelong learners, resilient pro problem solvers, but also empathetic leaders. That's really important because we know the future is so uncertain and complex. And just to say that it's really great to be in a room like this where we have academics, we have ministers, we have governments, we need private sector. We all need to work together to really make this a reality. Thank you very much, Uma. Um, hi, Harry, it's great to have you here as well. Uh, let's pass to you, please, for the first, just a quick um, summary on the first question. Thank you. I'll I'll, uh, I'll pick up on uh, one point that uh, Uma made on the seventy percent. So seventy percent of children in low and middle income countries uh, cannot read and understand a simple text. That was the uh, the context that we're in as a result of COVID. But before COVID, uh, learning outcomes were not improving. The the crisis existed before COVID. Uh, but we did learn that as a result of uh, of schools closing, how important schools were, how important teachers were, uh, because when we took that away from children, they, they learned less. So obviously the school made a difference, even in very poor communities, the teachers made a huge difference, their absence uh, was felt. So the, the, the flip side of this, there, there is a uh, positive thing that we've learned about what, what schools do. And building on, on the points about the foundational skills, it is more than uh, numeracy and literacy, uh, but we need to get that right before we have many other things that we want to have uh, through education. So starting early, uh, long before school starts, uh, investing in, in uh, children and their, in their uh, families and their, in their environments to prepare them for, for school. And then at school, and I think uh, some of the, the, the ministers uh, made similar points that uh, we need to guarantee that the children uh, read, uh, do math, uh, other things very early in their uh, career. It's, uh, it's not enough to set the target um, or to, to, to look at the outcomes, but we need to make sure that people are coming to school and within those first few years, they're actually learning uh, how to read uh, and write uh, it's not a high bar, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so uh, I think that's the, the second point. And the third point I would make 
on this is that the foundational uh, learning continues. You you build the base, uh, and then we can start putting other skills on that. Those foundational um, that foundational learning is a gateway uh, skill for many other things that we want to achieve through our education systems and to improve uh, the the country, the planet, and to achieve those goals is a is a positive first step. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So definitely what I'm hearing is a very, very, some amazing ideas and also very bold and ambitious, um, which is good. That's hence the, the word transformation, because we all recognize currently in general around the world, we're not meeting the needs of children, even in a more narrow foundational learning itself, but and the need for us to have broader approach, the need for us to transform. All right. I think we're going to stick with the same order if it's okay, just to keep it simple. We are going to have to uh, be very uh, concise to make up a little bit of time. And so, Joe, I'm going to pass back to you. And just to now, to, again, as concrete as possible, what are the key actions or recommendations would GPE recommend to transform education in order to support, I guess, what you can call it the whole child or along these same lines that we've all been talking about, a broader definition of what children need during their learning journey. A huge question, of course, and uh, the point about being both a fund and a partnership is we don't recognize that this is something that anybody can do in isolation. It's very much a partnership effort, and it's a partnership effort behind the leadership of government. So I think, you know, the first thing that we do then, and, you know, we've got some great examples with Sierra Leone here, is uh, is have a conversation. Um, and talk about what the political leadership wants and the willingness to identify and address, address stubborn implementation issues. Um, and then to align education stakeholders, both internally, so, you know, the teachers, the communities towards pulling in the same direction, but also, of course, the external partners, but also to learn as you go along. So no reform process is going to be perfect. Every single context is going to be different. There are going to be different and difficult implementation blockages. So that openness about saying, well, this is not working so well. We've got the data. We've got the lessons learned. How can we address that as we going along? And that's an openness and a conversation um, that we need to have. Um, I guess what I guess a key issue, as I said earlier, is we don't tell governments this is your priority. We want to be part of the conversation. We we want to engage a partnership conversation because we know that if everybody's pulling in the same direction with an education system, you have a higher chance of success. And that is what we're looking at. Um, I, I would say just a couple of last points because we'll keep it brief. You know, Hugh at the beginning talked about the polarization of debate around foundational learning. When we look at the 2030 or so, what we call partnership compacts that countries are putting together, we do not see this polarization. It seems to me that that global debate around the polarization is somehow less relevant in the country examples where really, you know, understandably, every country is going to say, we want a broad and engaging education for our children that reflects our nation's values. And yes, we want foundational literacy and numeracy to be a critical part of that. So I think in a way we need to kind of get rid of the polarization and thinking that this is something that's really deep, because quite frankly, I don't think it is. But I do think that we are struggling in many systems to try to do too many things. Obviously, an education system is going to try to do a lot of things. But that idea that you can have a strategic priority focus amongst all of those things that can drive change for the system is where we've been trying to have the conversation. Um, I will conclude my remark by saying that this is not obviously possible without financing and alignment technical and financial alignment and within that i mean within the education system you know if your minister is saying one thing but your decentralized levels are doing another and your head teachers are doing another you're not going to have alignment you're all going to be pulling in different directions and your money isn't following the route of your reform you've got an issue there but you've also got an issue when external partners come in and say, I've got the answer, do this, do this, do it my way. So we need a degree as external partners of an ability to say, how can we work behind you in moving this forward? How can we bring evidence or technical capability or financing 
to support the reform effort in country. So that's a lot of what we are trying to do. That's the theory behind what we're doing and we're learning as we go. Thank you very much, Joe. Rajiv, um, some sort of con concrete suggestions, actions on how, how education systems can promote global citizenship. I know something you feel really strongly about. Sure, Robert. Uh, the series is about examples from the field. Uh, um, and I just want to extend on what we were saying earlier about global citizenship being central uh, to building a sustainable future. Uh, and well, we, we didn't start off with the idea when we started offering climate education. Uh, we were, were proud to have introduced the first climate education program that was experiential. So basically, we took learners to different parts of the world on live streamed uh, interactive journeys where they got to see the impact of climate change and where they learned about best practices uh, in solutions and sustainability. Uh, so, for example, on a, on a session that talks about the uh, impact of industry uh, on the on the planet, uh, we start in London, uh, where we where against the backdrop of uh, the bigger fashion brands, uh, we talk about how we produce 100 billion garments every year. Uh, we then also learn how 85% of these garments are, are thrown in the same year. We then trace the journey of these clothes to countries in Africa. Uh, where to 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 secondhand marketplaces where which now receive 15 million garments every single week. So we 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 take learners on this live stream trip where we meet market sellers who are now dealing with this in, invasion of uh, clothes that we've thrown from the global north. We then trace the journey of these clothes to a landfill, mountains of garbage, mostly made up of synthetic clothes that we've thrown, the rampant fires that that break out, the, the smoke that goes into the slums next to these landfills. So basically the whole journey of the action of a few of us and how that has a knock-on effect on people 6,000 miles away. But on the same journey, we then uh, go and learn about solutions and sustainability in Amsterdam. So, and we found that the, the, the programs we were doing were having a lot of impact. And we first thought that this was a result of the experiential nature of our programs. Uh, but what we realized is that it was the one-on-one -on -one connections that the learners were making. So for example, Kelvin, who we meet on, on the landfill uh, in, in Kenya, when he says that we breathe the same air, but the air that you breathe and the air I breathe is different, it's difficult to ignore what he's saying because now you're connecting to a person standing on a landfill, you are connecting to the humanness within you. And so we realized that it's the human connections and we, we made changes to the program. So we uh, we attached a global citizenship module before our climate program. And so now learners started going to different countries around the world and, and uh, discovering cultures, uh, discovering global religions and, and languages, and also identifying their, their similarities uh, amidst the differences. Uh, we also added a climate action module to the end of this program because we wanted to see what happens when you when you offer uh, uh, learners global uh, citizenship education. Uh, and so more recently, we offered this education to uh, students in three countries, India, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe. And we all know that uh, India and Pakistan uh, haven't been the most friendliest of, of neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> but on this program, what we found is that learners were not only connecting with people that they met in climate impacted countries, but they were also connecting with each other. So the students in India and the students in Pakistan, uh, they were right, they were telling each other stories, uh, they were writing poems for each other, they were distraught when they when they parted ways. Um, and one learning that I really want to emphasize on is what we saw at the end with the climate action project. Not only were they now taking best practices from the countries that they went to, so they went to Brazil and they, they saw that how uh, the indigenous communities in the Amazon uh, were practicing regenerative farming for 12,000 years before we now suddenly have made it the, the, the fashionable word. Uh, and they tried to see how they can take that learning and implement it in India and Pakistan. But they also started creating projects for each other. So as we speak, there's a team in Zimbabwe which is is trying to imagine a, a, an urban community garden in a slum in Kibera. Now, this isn't something that we engineered. We just created the forum where they connected and where, where they are now finding solutions for each other. 
so uh, if we have the time, uh, Rob, I'd, I'd love to show a very quick one minute video on the back, the back of the scenes, or, or we can leave it for later. Uh, Sounds good. I'd say we hang on to it for later. Okay. And um, but but it's definitely we're going to do our best to get it Thank to you. have it shown. Can we move to Uma now? Uma skills. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Well done, Ajit. Great question. Great question. A uh, great response. Thank you. Great ideas. Um, I know we're all um, concerned about the growing gap, if you'd like, the, the skills that youth are acquiring and the skills that are needed in ever-changing society, including the green skills. What would you recommend? Where does Gen U come into this? Sure. So we know um, that to secure a sustainable future for our planet and all its people, we know that the world needs to reach net zero. So that means cutting greenhouse gases as close to zero as possible. Now, the question we face, you know, when we talk about there's also a, an employment, youth employment challenge, there's a learning crisis, but how will we ensure the green transition is a just transition? That's the key issue. That's a key question for the Generation Unlimited Partnership. So that means including by serving those who are least responsible for climate change, but most vulnerable to its impact. So when we look at the world's 1.2 billion young people ages 15 to 24, who are at risk of not having the green skills they need to participate in the employment and entrepreneurial marketplace. So this risk is particularly acute for young women in low-income countries. So first of all, it's important to understand like what is a green skill? Because there's a lot of discussion around it at the COP27, many education forums, even here, it's gonna come up this week. While there's no universally agreed definition of green skills, the literature does make some common distinctions. So there's the technical or applied skills that are specific. It could be farmers implementing different types of fertilizer or irrigation systems or kind of a lot of the things you were talking about, those skills are required. But there's also a core or fundamental, fundamental skills that are highly transferable. So that's what we were talking about in the morning, teamwork, resilience, networking, they're both important. So targeting the right skills is really key for job creation. This is a really primary objective when we're looking at Generation Unlimited's work with the public private youth ecosystem. The ILO and other agencies have predicted that shifts in the production and use of energy will significantly outweigh the loss of fossil fuel production jobs. So this is crucial to upskill young people so that they can perform the jobs needed to deliver the net zero and thrive in a green economy. So we just need to ensure that the most disadvantaged youth don't miss out on these opportunities. So it's crucial for them to be equipped with an environmentally sustainable skill set that will be enable energy efficiency, waste reduction, sustainable project management and eco-conscious decision-making, many of the things that come into the initiatives you were describing um, just now. And they're not just limited to jobs in environment science or clean tech. Actually, they can be, a, you can have an environmental sustainability lens in financial healthcare and the arts. So it's important, I think, to look at the learning to earning pathway in a holistic way, livelihood opportunities connected to green skills. Um, for the whole partnership of the Generation Unlimited, which is a number of organizations worldwide and anchored in UNICEF, it's about, you know, looking at programs that train young people in green entrepreneurship or learning agripreneurship skills, driving volunteerism and climate resilience, and even digital skills that promote green employment. In the afternoon, you'll hear more about an initiative called Green Rising, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, where a number of partners have come together to foster these green skills in volunteerism and advocacy, all in the spirit of SDG 4.7, while transforming existing jobs into green jobs and nurturing a carter of green entrepreneurs. And we'll hear from the young people this afternoon. And just a shout out to Radhika, too, because I think a lot of the research that's being done at Columbia University in the Earth Institute bringing together students and young people and we've had capstone projects with the Generation Unlimited that are looking at this and learning from the field and experiential learning approaches are really important if we're going to look at a brighter future. Um, what I've seen in the field, I mean, you mentioned a number of examples, and I don't want to be too long, but just to say the just one Imagine Ventures um, uh, initiative, which was part of a Columbia capstone project, a graduate thesis, where you had an example of a youth led young people got together in Bangladesh and transformed highways into a renewable energy source by using power generated by fast moving vehicles. Um, and into wind energy for clean and renewable energy. Just amazing. A number of other examples, but you'll hear more about that in the afternoon from our young leaders. And just to end, <laughs> that was my last point, is that I think that 
what what I'd want to end with is that these investments, whatever we investment, I think will yield a triple dividend. So we'll contribute to net zero while also reducing inequality and addressing the learning and employment challenge. So in order to catalyze that fair world for children and youth and not leave them further behind, we have a narrow window of opportunity to act. So just working together to ensure that this green transition is truly a just transition powered Thank by young people. Much. I appreciate it. it. Thank you. Larry, over to you very briefly on measurement, and we've, we've, a few have brought it up. Yes, thank you. So we, we do have a framework for addressing the, the learning challenge uh, developed as a, as a result of the COVID pandemic and the school closures, rapid framework, uh, reaching every child, assessing, learning, prioritizing, teaching the fundamentals, increasing the efficiency of instruction, and developing psychosocial health and well-being. The framework is based on evidence and experience and uses uh, a framework with, with an idea that children learn when their teachers understand their current levels, hmm. where they're taught a curriculum that aligns with their learning needs, that uses effective pedagogies, and which targets support to those at risk of falling behind. This is critical given that post-COVID, we have far more heterogeneity in, in a given classroom with different learning levels and so many children are far, far behind where they should be given their age and time in school. So what, what needs to, to happen is we need to support teachers. We need to provide them with the training and coaching they require. We need to develop the socio-emotional skills as, as an end in itself, but also to aid in the learning uh, prog process and also making sure that schools are available, students are attending regularly. So all this requires information. Teachers need the information to uh, to to know where where their students are, so they can target the uh, instruction. School administrators need to know where their where their systems are. But uh, far too many countries are not measuring learning outcomes regularly. We don't have uh, even post COVID uh, data for many uh, middle and low income countries about how far behind students have come. Uh, countries are making efforts more and more to develop. Uh, adequate assessment systems. Uh, we would recommend low stakes assessments that allow them to, to use the information for teachers, to cater to students' uh, learning needs, also for the system to, uh, right. to make adjustments as necessary, but also to build an assessment culture where we're not just measuring basic reading and math, but other skills that are important that can be built upon this strong assessment system. And finally, sharing that information among school uh, teachers, heads, uh, parents, communities, to foster also a culture of accountability and to make sure that there is continuous improvement going forward. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Maybe one final appreciation to all the panelists for such an engaging discussion. Thank you very, very much. Over to you, please. Uh, with that, we'll uh, move over to Professor Sachs. He's here and he'll uh, provide some concluding remarks as well as providing us a vision for Mission 4.7 and Target 4.7 as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody gathering for this very important brainstorming and uh, apologies for my... Uh, very tight schedule between uh, the UN and here, so I'm gonna have to run immediately uh, after my remarks. I wanna say something very uh, uh, direct to the education community, uh, including all the organizations we just heard. We're failing. The kids are not finishing school. They're not learning adequately. They're not even in school. If you look at low-income countries, maybe it's one-fourth of the secondary school completion. And maybe for lower secondary, maybe 40%. This is a disaster. It's unbelievable to me. I've been involved with the MDGs and the SDGs now for 23 years. 
the education sector has been underinvested during the entire period. And the leaders of the education sector are so nice because they're teachers, they work with children, they don't know how to raise their voice and tell the truth. Global Partnership for Education gets, what, $800 million a year? And it should be $20 billion a year. So I regard it not even as helpful. I'm sorry to say because people think they're doing something when they're not. I don't mean the Global Partnership, I mean the donors. They get to check a box. Yes, we've given to education. You have to run some numbers. It's basically an Excel spreadsheet. And let me just point out very simply, poor countries are young countries. They typically have had in recent years high fertility rates. That means that the school age population as a share of the total population is very high, maybe three times what it is in a high income country. And the number of well-educated people is very low. So the cost of education per student measured as a ratio to GDP per capita is extremely high in low-income countries. So when I do the spreadsheet, you need 10 to 20% of GDP for education to cover your children. Maybe four or 5% in a rich country but maybe 15 to 20% in a poor country. I could show you that in five minutes. And I could show you there's not one low-income country in the world that can afford SDG4 right now, period. It's basic. So you can tell them all the wonderful things. You can get all the presidents to commit to it. The kids will not be in school. They will not have qualified teachers. There will not be water. There will not be hygiene in the school. They will not learn. They will not even be in the school. There will not be materials. It's dollars and cents. That's what it is. So come on, let's tell the truth to these heads of state coming tomorrow. And I mean the rich ones, not the poor ones, the poor ones, the Heads of poor countries know this. We are not going to do this without a massive increase of financing. Let's stop faking it. Sheikha Moses exactly right. Education above all. I can tell you it's the most important investment from every point of view for a society. There's nothing more important, not even water and sanitation and electricity. If you're not having the children in school, forget it. There's no hope for your society in the 21st century. And there's no budget for it. If you look at the Delhi Declaration that was just completed last week for the G20, it's quite telling, I want to say, to the leaders of the education community. Because it's a very good outcome document in general. I think a brilliant leadership by Prime Minister Modi. And it's got finance all over the place for climate. And it's got finance for infrastructure. And it's got finance for transport corridors and it's got finance for health look at the section on education it doesn't even mention finance shame you're not even on the agenda i mean it seriously this is the most important investment and i can tell you about the rich countries they don't care okay if you had any doubt, I come from one, I've been doing this for decades, they don't give a damn, okay? But they need to have responsibility. I don't care whether they care or not. 
They need responsibility. They don't have it right now. So we need to say what we need for SDG4 is at least $50 billion a year. Don't even consider something less. By the way, I don't even mind if it comes in loans, I have to tell you, as long as it's 40-year loans, because the return on education takes 40 years to realize. You have to put the kids through school. Then they have to join the labor market. Then they have to have some experience. Then the payoff to society is unbelievably high. So don't take a five-year loan for a 40-year return. But I can tell you, economically and financially, the return is about the highest return you can find. Higher than Tesla, higher than AI, higher than the tech companies. Educating a child, I mean in a dollars and cents terms, of what skills you get, what marginal productivity of labor you get, what investments you get. There is no higher return than to put the five-year-old in school, help her go all the way through upper secondary, help her achieve all her potential, and then she will find her way. So will he. But that's an investment that requires 20 years and then 20 years to reap the return. So don't expect this on a five-year euro bond. But this is what our multilateral agency should be doing. And the Global Partnership for Education, frankly, either raise at least 10 billion a year or make clear that you're not really accomplishing a partnership for education, seriously. I'm not a critic of GPE, I'm a critic of it serving as a placeholder. Because I watch these heads of state come and say, we did it, we did a replenishment round, which I know is a death sentence for students all over the world because they won't be in a classroom. So we absolutely have to get real on this. I'm a loudmouth, publicly obnoxious, privately a nice guy. And I want to advocate for this, and I've said this for 20 years. I came up with the idea of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria with Kofi. We championed it. We raised a lot of money. I will do the same for education, I promise you. But, but come on, where's our $50 billion a year call? It's not even on the agenda right now. Where are all these multilateral development banks? I promise you, I know every president of every one of them. I've trained their senior staff over the last 40 years. We can get this done. But we need the education community to stand up and say, don't ask us to do this without teachers, without facilities, without connectivity, without devices, without water, electricity. Come on. Let's get real. We will need and we can have a lot of innovation along the way. I love Globe from Home. We're, thank you. Wonderful. 15 years, by the way, the first video conference I ever did just to show you, A, how old I am, and B, what kind of world we have, how much it we're advancing. The first time I ever had a video conference was in 1996 where I asked the then finance minister of India, Minister Chindambaran, to have a conference with us at Harvard. And he agreed, and we contacted VSNL and AT&T. It only took three weeks and lots of, I don't know, 10,000 bucks to wire the hotel facility. And then we had a miracle that the finance minister was on a screen 
and we talked live to him. It was a world changer for me. I could barely believe it. He said, if we can connect this way, oh, my God. Twelve years later, I developed something at Columbia we called the Global Classroom. And the idea was to connect campuses around the world to get together online. That was 15 years ago, in 2008. And all we had to do was hire a full-time operator who would make the calls into each of the campuses and then manage the discussion in the chat room and so on. So the cost had come down probably a hundredfold from, or a thousandfold from the event with Mr. Chindamran. Now, my life is nothing but Zooms. This is probably the first occasion that I see real human beings in a long time. It's free. We can connect the world. We can connect students, exactly what you're saying. We can reach students that are otherwise without a school nearby. All we need, deal with the telecoms. Go to Reliance, get uh, some uh, low-cost geos in their hands. Ask any of the tech companies in the telecoms. Don't expect the students to be online without data and without a device. And don't expect them not to lose the device, by the way, or break it the third day. So have a little resources in this. Get Apple to put something in. Get Google to put something in. Get Reliance to put something in. Get Bartiertel to put something in. We just need to ask them. But at scale, not as another pilot project. No more pilots. We will learn along the way, of course. Education is never done learning. My pedagogy, what I, how I teach and interact, of course, is completely different from 40 years ago. By the way, for the first 30 years, it seemed exactly the same. And now everything changes every minute because we can do so many creative things right now that's unbelievable. But we need connectivity devices, hardware, a plan, local languages, a budget. And my whole career has been dealing with finance ministers that don't have money. And I beg for a living or complain for a living. And once in a while, something good happens. I complained for years that Africa needed to be in the G20 to be the 21st member. It happened this time. I had so many conversations around the world. Let's not miss the chance. Now, Africa's in the front table. Africa's the biggest education crisis in the whole world. I'm going to the UN just now to talk to African leaders. Don't miss this opportunity. You're at the front table. Make your clear calls. So I'm begging all of my favorite organizations Honestly, I spend all my time trying to support you guys, but I cannot support you if you're not leading with the call for reality. The reality is every kid needs to be in school. That's what we pledged. That's only sanity. What's a kid going to do without an upper secondary education in the 21st century? suffer, be in impoverishment, drown in the Mediterranean, God knows what. What are they going to do if they have a good education? Everything possible, because it's a wonderful world if you're empowered. So I'm really good at Excel spreadsheets. I really have a loud mouth. I'm going to sit with the world leaders right now I will tell them, but I want UNESCO and UNICEF and Global Partnership for Education and UNHCR because you have a lot of kids in camps and dislocated and displaced. I want you to listen to Sheikh Moza. Education above all. Mean it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Sachs. Thank you. Um, education above all. It's such a simple slogan. And if we mean it, I'm sure we'll be able to do much, much more wonders with what we can in the current moment. And you know, as Professor Sachs said, driving the momentum and bringing all of us together, going ahead with education above all. I think that's really, truly what we need to um, uh, pick up on. Uh, with that, I think this uh, event in the afternoon session, we will start uh, with the eco ambassadors and students coming from all over the world coming and discussing. But uh, we'll uh, maybe have like a quick turnaround. We'll have a certificate that I want to um, ask a special person to provide one of our earliest eco ambassadors. Uh, Vidya Bindal is here. Vidya, maybe you can come here. And uh, Dr. Mary Joy Pigozi is here from the Educator Child Foundation. She is the Executive Director of Educator Child and has been leading the program since 2012 with a lot of experience, uh, multi-country experience. I think she's the best person to uh, provide this um, symbolic acknowledgement and an honor to uh, Eco Ambassadors, uh, which is a program run at the Center for Sustainable Development, which helps to provide um, science and social science background to students that need to do activism through uh, education for sustainable development lens and global citizenship lens. And uh, they do a lot of um, summer programs with us and they also work in the communities to focus on a lot of community action and service. So I'll ask Dr. Mary to uh, please come here and uh, award the certificate to our eco ambassador, Vidya. Thank you very much, and it's um, great that we really, as educators, got that challenge to do something. And one of my pleasures now is to actually acknowledge a group of youngsters who do do things for us. So it is my pleasure to congratulate this year's Columbia University Eco Ambassadors for their leadership and their work as they've contributed to change in their communities. Their work towards positive change is founded in facts, facts that have been tested through rigorous processes. Among the topics that the Eco Ambassadors have delved into are global citizenship education and education for sustainable development. These areas are critically important to the topic of today's deliberations and actually clear to my, dear to my heart personally. Most important, these, to these topics and the work of the, of the ambassadors is a commitment to human rights, to justice and dignity for all, a commitment to respect and protect the planet that sustains each and every one of us. These are two areas of education to which I've committed a lot of my life. So I do understand the depth of understanding, the complexity of relationships, and the challenges of making these concepts practical and usable in everyday life. These eco ambassadors have faced these challenges, they've put theory into practice, and they've worked locally to make a difference globally. I give you this now, thank you very much. Your efforts are inspiring. Please don't forget the importance of your contributions. Thank you for keeping up the good work and thank you for helping take care of our planet. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you, Dr. Miri. Um, we have not had time to have coffee. We have not had time to do anything because of our packed schedule and because of uh, times that we have to match with the road closures and everything else. So please uh, have some coffee and I think there will be also lunch served a little bit later, but this is a good transition between the morning session and the afternoon. The afternoon will start with a lot of eco ambassador and youth activism and we adults will be quiet and we'll listen to the students. I think that's what we need now going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Please go ahead and have lunch, coffee.
Yes, definitely. So in the afternoon we have organized a workshop. I think they'll get a chance to talk and engage and meet the different people. Yes, of course. And you send the uh, the addresses. I uh, I am recognized that. Okay, you continue your inspiring work, sir. Because of you, you are able to get the kids here. Oh. No wonder the indicators are much better. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Thank you. 